Hello and welcome to the ODI Friday Lunchtime Lecture today, Friday 20th of May. I'm Hannah redler Hawes, the Director of the Data as Culture Programme at the Open Data Institute, and I'm delighted to be able to introduce a team of curators from the Royal College of Art who've been working in partnership with us um, over the last year or so, and they're going to present their project Waterways, so I'll hand over to Kylie Kim on behalf of the curatorial team. Hi everyone, thank you for joining us today. So we are six curators from Royal College of Art uh, contributing to the art project Waterways, an invitation to reimagine the ecology of the Regents Canal. And I'm Kylie and we'll introduce our project and artists. So Waterways is a project commissioned by the ODI in partnership with the Royal College of Art and for the 2022 data as culture art program. So this project restores and regenerates broken relationships between human and living organisms of the Regents Canal. And the project explores the canal's biodiversity and lived histories to understand and challenge the way we generate, collect and store environmental data. And the research is collected from a broad range of people. So scientists, Central St. Martin academics and students uh, who do their projects on uh, protecting ecosystem and local inhabitants, as well as um, artists and creative participants. And this research is presented in the form of three chapters, uh, Voices of Water, learning canals ecosystem and archiving futures. So at the core of the project is an art commissioned by the artist collectives Ausflow and Applied Logic that have co-created co a gamified tool named Canal Observatory, which collects environmental data. And by looking at the biodiversity of canal um, and recognizing it through canal images, canal observatory reflects on who can collect data, how this is accessible, as well as how we can improve our relationships between us and environment. And also a new website that hosts waterways is about designed by uh, Applied Logic, presents an open resource archive, a recordings of the voices of water and project documentation along with the digital gamified tool for data collection created by Ausbla. So today the curators from Waterways will speak with the two collectives uh, they we have worked from and expanding some of our research findings and ideas of what the results canal might become in the future. And so Osla, one of our artists, uh, they're Chris and Elisa, and they are creative design studio based in London, leading playful investigations into materiality, ecosystems, and human experience. So throughout the work, they collate diverse opinions and cover systemic challenges and imagine resilient futures to inspire an active engagement with our rapidly changing world. So um, under our commission, they have conducted a wonderful workshop uh, with system students, extensive research that has explored um, multiple layers of the resource canal ecosystem and resulting in a dynamic gamified tool canal observatory that seeks not only to give a voice to the ecosystem, but question who has the power to collect and share the data. And also there's another guest, um, Tom from Applied Logic. Uh, so Applied Logic is a collective focused on design and innovation, um, exploring the significant social changes that are transforming, transforming everyday life. And they experiment with emerging technologies to develop speculations and solutions that aim to help build a better future for people and also for the planet. 
So continuing my introduction, I will now pass to Fergus, uh, who will lead a conversation between uh, Chris, Alyssa, Ausblau, and Tom from Applied Logic. And also, finally, we have a Q&A section. So you can hear another four curators, Kiara, Sage, Jachi, and Marjorie. Thanks, Kylie. Um, so collectively, we've been working on this project for around nine months now, um, and we've just finished a very wet installation this morning at County Street Natural Park, um, in which we have finally installed the gamified tool uh, canal observatory, which invites citizen scientists to reconnect with Regent's Canal. Um, firstly, Chris and Lissa, how are you feeling post that? <laughs> very wet. <laughs> Feels like we just jumped out of the shower or something. It's like, yeah, very wet outside. Good day to install. <laughs> At least the ground was soft. I guess that was the, the plus side on it. Yeah. Uh, so accompanying uh, these structures, uh, Applied Logic have helped you build a digital side of the game. Um, could one of you please explain how the game works and what participants will experience when they interact with Canal Observatory? Yeah, so it was really great for us to, to work with Applied Logic, who very much align with our interests in, in where this tool, we would always say it's more like a gamified tool, uh, has to head. Uh, it's a rather simple platform. We want to keep it as accessible as possible. So it's based on a web, you know, on a website rather than on an app. You don't have to download anything. You just go onto the website and you can log on different things you see, and you can find information of different elements you can observe on the canal. Very, very straightforward. And it was great to work with Applied Logic because there was an overall ideal of how this should be kept quite um, environmentally friendly. But I'm sure Tom will say a lot about this too. Yeah, and the, on just on the physical side of the installation, so the um, Camley Street National Park, um, you can actually walk up to the, the observatory frames um, and we invite passers-by to look through those frames and look at what biodiversity is in that space. And there are prompts that are around the frame that guide the viewer to think differently about that space and not just, you know, count the plants and the insects, but see it as an ecosystem that involves air, soil below, you know, air above the, the ground and, and more of a 3D space. Um, so that links to the online tool. Yeah, it was nice to out earlier on how there was a, a great element of that through the workshop that you guys led with CSM students. Um, you, for the rest of you, we effectively had these quadrants that um, Chris and Lisa laid out across the park and the students came in pairs and they started by drawing what they saw and then evolved through that, through these various prompts. And that's now been brought into um, the quadrants. So it's really nice around the edge, there's that bit. So people first see them, they kind of see them protruding out the ground and almost organic. And then there's that little sort of invitation of ways in which we see these spaces. Um, yeah, I think that um, came a bit from, you know, when, when scientists, actually observe the ecosystem and they have they use these quadrants in a very scientific way they they log how many insects jump into that space but what we wanted to to explore with the students and a lot of the outcomes are quite a surprise and and um really interesting but what we wanted to understand is that space is as an ecosystem in itself like what's involved in that bubble beyond what you physically see um through you know smell and light and um sound um, so yeah, it was nice to to have the outcomes of that to to bring into the project. Yeah. Um, Tom, I'm not even going to try and begin to explain the technical side of things. So perhaps uh, for the audience, could you explain how the digital infrastructure works and what processes you use to create it? Yeah, sure. So just focusing the tool or the whole website. Uh, just on Canal Observatory for now. Yeah. So. It's relatively simple because we didn't want to you know, consume too much energy. Uh, the kind of only um, other component at play is like a database so that it obviously collects um, any interaction and any species counted. And aside from that, it's just kind of a, a list of all the different species that Ausbla have identified through the research and created these playful emojis which we've then divided. So that's like a process of bit mapping. So you, 
<clears throat> removing the pixels from the emoji in order to lower the file size and then also align it with the rest of the identity so the consistent visual language um, and then also in order to kind of sing as it was uh, a fairly big task within the time that we had it was aiming to keep it as simple as possible um, and not trying to build it out for the sake of you know making it um, overly complex uh, but kind of considering the audience that we're targeting and making it easy to interact with. Yeah, it was exciting today actually. I think we saw our first bit of data collection that we'd actually have a coop when in was heading towards one of the squares. And then also we saw the methane bubbles. Um, because what happens is when someone logs these things, and of course the website updates and says how many logs that there have been. And so it becomes this data archive that builds. Um, so Ward's Waves was born from us seeing a synergy from how the canals connect us and how they re revolutionized the, con uh, the country over 250 years ago. Um, and then thinking of how data now acts as that connecting and revolutionizing force. Uh, and furthermore, the synchronicity between the flow of data and the flow of water was an undeniable factor that we can now we're approaching the system. Um, from this, we started to think about how through data we could begin, begin to reconnect the water and how we might um, give a voice to water. Ausblau, could you tell us about what interested you in the canals and why you felt it important for us to reconnect with this ecosystem? Yeah, for us, the canals really became quite interesting. I mean, we we, we started talking with you about the canals and then afterwards, we, we also dived more into the history of the canal. And it was quite intriguing to, to read up on how canals were originally created for industrial use. You know, they were a huge part of uh, transporting goods, really. Uh, far distances through the entire UK and how this led to this vast network of canals and how today canals have transformed into majorly living spaces for people. Um, but already now the canal and river trust marks all these properties of the canals that could act as um, important features for uh, our fight in the climate uh, against the climate crisis. And it, it became for us a bit this this quest of thinking there's such an enormous potential in the canals as a as an ecosystem beyond what it is today and how can we make people aware of this quality of these qualities and aware of different elements that that, that people might have to be aware in in this sort of uh, collective mm. challenge yeah and not just seeing it as a space that you know looks pretty that you know we want to live on and you and it's sort of exploiting it for human use it's our interest in the canal is like how can we make this a coexistent space that we we don't over dominate with you know building concrete paths along the entire canal and building all the nice buildings along the canal but how do we mark out some space for for um, non-human beings and you know because in the end supporting that will in turn help us as Chris was saying fight climate change and keeping the waterways um, there also you know acts as a heat sink for the city when you know as things are getting hotter and uh, climate's getting hotter we need that we need to cool down our cities and um, yeah and I think it's it's recognizing that that everything that belongs to the canal that's you know not for human use has a really important role to play and we need to really coexist with that understand it have a better relationship with it um yeah and ultimately negotiate or renegotiate the space that we share with other species and yeah, other yeah parts that, of the ecosystem. that recognition point Alyssa, that you're making i think is um really important in what you're saying like I know when we're doing the voice of water section of the project, just even the audio recordings of soundscapes from down at the Canary Street end, which are a lot more natural, to then once we got more towards the Islington Tunnel, and it was more sort of like building works and generators, and you could see that change. And you guys really um, capture this recognition in the, uh, a canal observatory, because it's not only the things that perhaps we would like to think of when we think of the canal, you've got things like swans and Canada geese and coots on there, which are the things that all of us who live in London, that's the most of wildlife we connect with. But also there are some things that perhaps we try to ignore, things like water bottles or food, that I think when people approach Canal Observatory, they don't immediately assume that's what the game's going to be them documenting. Um, and then also there are elements of things that perhaps we'll never see, but should be there, like Earlier, we were talking about the fact that there's a salmon on there and you've got a really beautiful dynamic image of it jumping out the water. 
which I think would be a, a nice thing to see, but sadly one that's far away. Um, so yeah, I think that's really important. I was just wondering, do you think you could tell us more about the data in this and like why it's important to make this data accessible and also what you hope from people having accessibility to this data, what maybe it will infer or where people might take this as citizen scientists? Yeah, I think with the, you know, when you open the platform and you start to see that there are, I don't know, 50 coots that have been logged in, but, um, and maybe a hundred water bottles, you know, this is just, um, thinking out loud that maybe maybe open up the platform and you see that and then you see zero salmon you know as a passerby who's logged onto this platform you start to then wonder like why am I seeing none of these sorts of fish species or you know this section of, of insects why am I not seeing them why am I seeing so much plastic and I think when when scientists go to observe um, the biodiversity and the and count insects um, it's very specific on counting the things that we want to see. But with Canal Observatory, we wanted to open up that platform to just what's there um, and invite people to, of course, see that, see it differently, to see um, bark and green algae. Um, but yeah, so I, I think also with that list of species, you can also click on the on the um, emojis and get a bit of information. And what we tried to do was, um, I mean, very succinct information because it's a small um, uh, um, space that we had to, to write. Um, but in that succinct bit of information, it's about understanding the role that that item or object um, or species has to play, whether that be positive or negative. We didn't, you know, put a, a try to not put a judgment on it and just, you know, give, give a sense of, um, how that relates to the voice of the canal. What is it saying about the canal because of its existence there? Um, or what is it not saying because it's not there? For example, the salmon. We don't see, and we're not going to, we won't be able to count salmons probably, but that's in, in turn saying something on its own that there's an imbalance in that ecosystem. I don't know if you want to add into that. But... No, that was very really nice. Yeah, and it is, I think it's important. Um point as well I think that it's something that perhaps people will get as they evolve more with the game is the fact that there are all these descriptions and that we will start to learn and there's not just a point of um, extracting data from a canal but also learning about these points and it's sort of a, a shared mm -hmm. thing and this again comes back to this idea of listening to water and listening what the canal has to offer, offer from us and using data as a way to make this more accessible. Yeah and, and one one thing on that um, we we revealed some sort of maybe less obvious things like um, I think it was the crayfish or one of the, the fish species when it actually puts its, la um, its um, larvae in the water, um, it ends up needing to have the water at a certain temperature for it to spawn and to, to develop. But as our, our cities are getting hotter and hotter, the water, you know, can only heat sink as much as it can and it absorbs this heat. And if the water gets too hot, the fish can't lay their eggs. So there's like other things that you don't see that we just sort of tried to make comments to within the information. Yeah, kind of trying to help us look for where, what, like what perhaps we could start to do smaller things, because I know that was a big thing as well when we were approaching the project when we were first working with you collaboratively was like what can we actually do what change will this create and is the change it's making positive and like what you guys finally produced um is the the quadrants which have a little like a carbon impact or anything like that but what they will do will start to make us understand smaller changes we can start to make to improve this ecosystem um and tom i know that the disparity of this ecosystem was also a big influence on you and applied logic in the visual identity of this project um, on the website, when people load it, there's a great element uh, where different things appear each time. Sometimes it's organic, sometimes it's um, artificial. Do you want to tell us a bit more about that? Yeah, for sure. I think that's like, I mean, a lot was just said, but what really like, resonated with me is this kind of idea of redefining our preconceptions of the canal. Um, and I guess that's like the power of our design is like using a, a creative perspective to redefine what we think of things. Um, so like a big part of the identity um, was kind of responding to the brief and this idea of like giving a voice to the water um, and kind of challenging our, yeah, as I said, challenging our preconceptions instead of just often thinking about water as something which is rather poetic and beautiful it 
it's challenging that and thinking, you know, with the climate crisis and whatnot, it's clear that that's less present um, within the canals and within any kind of natural habitats. And so instead of portraying the voice of water as something which is poetic and beautiful, we decided to think of the canal um, as the objects which are within it. So the kind of plastic pollution that we are often seeing and using that as their voice. Um, so for the identity, we directly sourced objects from the canal. So plastic bottles, um, balloons, um, styrofoam, um, but then also kind of having nice contrast to natural objects that we find, so kind of leaves, um, branches, um, kind of not much unless you want to kind of go deep into the water. Um, but I think that was the, the more important part was the kind of the, the artificial objects and kind of provoking people's thoughts um, by representing that in the identity. But then also, it's rather abstract in the way in which we've done it because we're trying to account for um, energy consumption and whatnot. So by dithering it, it becomes quite uh, ambiguous. But I think there's a slight importance in that as well about how we are referring to the kind of ambiguity of the future. Um, so yeah, so like underlying messages within the identity. And then also on top of the identity, obviously it's the website, which obviously plays a big part because um, as design and everything's coming more and more digital, we need to think about how that plays a role in the conversation of the climate. And so we've intentionally designed to be as low energy consuming as possible. So we use a kind of a black background with white text. So there's no um, need to kind of require uh, brighter pixel values, um, as well as using system fonts. So we're not kind of using, we could have obviously as a graphic designer to some extent, there's always that attraction to using the latest typeface, but kind of using the simple Times New Roman and Arial, which come with um, coding. There was also an interesting point I remember when we were first talking about that and you were telling us about the system fonts. Um, you explained as well that you thought about different processes of like who was reading this and what the implications of those fonts were and how we related different fonts to different things. Do you want to speak on that a little bit? In regards to what the... Well, you were saying the... about how different, uh, how there's a... Um, Sometimes we have like uh, what you're saying as graphic designers, you have an urge to use more sort of. Um, yeah. But now, you, but you as well, you found that there was another part. Not only with the energy saving, but there was a point of like we have different associations with different fonts, and you played around with that a bit in the use of Arial and Times New Roman, and where different ones are used at different points and the different audiences you're engaging with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that was a big part. I think it's as always considering just kind of see more. Kind of the sans serif, which is the font without the kind of elements in the end of the letters, are becoming more prominent. And so we thought about how we use sans serif to appeal to the younger audience, um, as well as having a balance between the serif typeface to maybe appeal to the kind of older audience, which might already have a existing interest in the canal. Um, and how does that kind of they work together to have a nice contrast and also. Um, refers to that contrast between the different target audiences that we're appealing to. Yeah, there's a great, um, it's also, it's become a great continuity link between all parts of the project is the dots that Hugh incorporated. The dots, I think, that have now become a bit of a, um, a staple of the whole project because they appear everywhere and they kind of, they dominate everything we do because they are the quadrants that sort of connect us all. Um, and they appear as well, Chris and Alyssa, in your, um, in the quadrants we installed today as well your text in line with that. I wonder, did you want to talk a bit more about, um, we were talking this morning about the painstaking process of choosing the colours, and now you have this beautiful green that seems almost organic, but it also has its future elements. Do you maybe want to talk about that as a process? Yeah, I think um, we we wanted the, like a big, a big part of this for us. Sorry, they've started doing some works outside. So they, I don't know if you can hear a bit of background noise, apologies. Um, but we wanted to have that this um, physical element was attractive to the younger generation as well as, um, you know, across, across all generations, but also that we established this you know, younger generation as sort of like future guardians of our 
our ecosystems and making people making the younger generation more aware of the space. Um, so we wanted to uh, bring in this gamified element because of that that um, reason. So part of the picking the colors was, you know, how do we balance something that's not intrusive to the natural environment, but still has this gamified element um, and, you know, still brings this sort of technique, uh, technology sort of digital um, coloration, but that doesn't, yeah, take away from this, the, the flowers and the colors that are there. So we actually ended and up- And it doesn't distract the pollinators of the flowers too. Yeah, I was gonna say, so we were, we were tossing up between, you know, really bright orange or like signal orange or signal yellow. Um, but then in the end, when you see the flowers and what insects will be attracted to that, they'll be attracted to the frame and that sort of becomes an interruption in that ecosystem. We wanted to pick a color that, you know, they would still be attracted to the flowers above the frame. Um, so we ended up going for a bright green, which in the meadow space, actually, it sort of picks up some of the overall tones of the of the grass, but a bit brighter and a bit more um, gamified looking. Um, yeah, so. Yeah, I think that's a, um, a really important, important point to make as well. Like very early in the project, we spoke to, and there's a recording of this conversation, uh, of one of the latest conversations with him, but the ecologist Mark Spencer, and there was a big thing he said about projects like ours, um, projects that sort of aim to have more sustainable output or aim to focus on ecology and biodiversity, and that there's always an element of our aesthetics coming in, that we always have this aesthetic tendency that although we think of like rewilding, if we think of rewilding by the canal, we might think of what we think the canal should look like and not what nature perhaps wants the canal to look like. And I think what you're saying there about the whole, how actually if you made them yellow or orange, you then might have ended up causing all of these insects to go in because they thought it was a pollinating factor. And also that's something that's, again, I think important to note with like the website and what Tom did is that again, that aesthetics here a lot of the time have been put on the back foot and people have thought, what's the, both of you guys have both thought, what's the most important thing here thinking sustainably and how can we create the best effect for this project? And then thinking the other elements and we ended up with these beautiful green quadrants actually, I think, there be any other color as well, it wouldn't have had the same effect they do, that they almost seem to be sort of being burst from the ground. Um, it's great. I just want to ask a closing question, um, which is, so data collection and sharing is incredibly important. We rely on it um, immensely in modern society. It's almost become the fuel that powers us. It's We rely on it as much as water to some extent. Um, but we are staring at one of the most startling dangers our planet has ever seen. And I wonder if either Applied Logic, Tom, or Chris and Lissa, either of you have any thoughts on how do you see digital design moving forwards in light of this? And what are the changes you would like to see being made in this industry to ensure that the lifeline does not cause too much of a harm on the planet? Good question. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, this is something I'm really passionate about and spent the final year of my um, degree kind of focusing on um, particularly having interest in emerging technologies, but not just kind of for technology's sake or art's sake, but using it for good as kind of, you know, because it sounds it's something which definitely needs, oh, it's already kind of coming more prominent within art and design but it's just the difference between like people talking about it and then actually doing it. And I know there's definitely like with any new technology or just the kind of general way in which you behave now is considering how we do things and considering the large implications of new technologies. And I think that kind of a big step that we need to take is reconsidering the kind of audience and the the larger implications of our work and so it not just being you know humans that are the target audience and the cons not kind of consumers that the nature might be the consumers or non-humans being part of that conversation and thinking about the impact that our art and design has in the world and that also has played a big role within this project and i think some has done it relatively well as um, Oslo talked about in their decision for the colour of the quadrant is that it's thinking about and considering how your design has an effect on the non-humans instead of just humans 
and that might not always appeal um, to clients and whatnot because um, often the objective might be you know, financially driven and so I think it's redefining what our goals are and our goals might be um, being more environmentally friendly and so I think that's a big takeaway from projects like these. And if, if we may come in at this point, I guess for us it's always interesting, although there's a lot of darkness heading towards us <laughs> in terms of the climate crisis, I think technology also has this interesting factor of forming a lens around people's perception today. People walking even to the bus, people will use the map and stare onto their phones the whole time while they do this. And everybody has these sort of individual backdrops and surrounding circumstances that they are creating through their interfaces, through their digital interfaces. And for us, I guess what makes uh, this really intriguing is that you can use these interfaces that accompany reality in order to make people interpret and translate the state of their individual circumstances and environments differently. And you can make them aware of things and you can make people the guardians of their systems in a different way if you are becoming someone who is interacting with this space. So mm -hmm. I think there's also a huge potential to use this dimension that is being created. Mm -hmm. And if this is being done in a way of yeah, looking out for the environment in a way that Tom just described, I think there's a, a nice potential of interaction. Mm. I think also just one other thing, like with the, the gamified tool, we could have taken it in a way of, you know, maybe making an, an AR layer on the space, or we could have, you know, really amplified it to use, you know, the best technologies that are out there and like, and, and kind of blow that up a bit. But in the end, we, we purposely brought it down as we spoke a lot today to, to look at the eco footprint of the digital layer. Um, and there we, you know, that may not be, for example, in, um, as uh, Tom was saying, in the interest of a client to do that. But for us, because we had this space that we could just explore, we chose to go down that angle together um, for that reason of balancing both the other yeah, ecosystem in a physical way, but also the digital footprint. Um, yeah, so a lot of choices were, were a balance, trying to balance this out. Yeah, I think... Uh... Chris used the phrase guardians of their systems um, to refer to how we should be using. I think that that's a, a really poetic way of describing, because that is effectively what you've invited every system scientist to do when they engage with Canal Observatory, is to become a guardian of that system and start to engage with Canal, um, start to engage with the canals. And the fact that Tom as well, you were tying that in with that the audience for this is not just humans, it's more than humans. And again, I think this is something that collaboratively you guys in creating the work you have made um, in all elements in things like the digital side of it with Tom, but then also inside of like the processes and stuff that Chris and Lissa, um, that you guys have developed, it really holds true to all of those. And like, like you said, from things like making sure it doesn't distract the pollination process and engaging that although humans might like a bright yellow circle, a bright yellow square, like that's not going to be the best thing for this. Then also thinking, how can we let people start to think beyond it and those prompts I think are a nice thing to think of with end this chat is that you guys thinking think small think beyond listen smell and sometimes when we just look at a piece of environment like you said chris we look on our phones and we distract and we ignore parts but i think that hopefully what the project picks up on and definitely the work that you guys have created is it will make people start to think through a looking glass and start to become guardians of their systems um so on that note i think i'm going to pass on to one of the co-creators, Chiara uh, Femengo, who I think has got a question. Thank you so much, guys. It's been a pleasure to listen to you after all these months together. I think um, we have achieved a lot in this time and it's great to hear and relive all this uh, process together. Um, and. For, on this note, I think I would like to go back to the beginning of our conversation when we started. And, and what we shared at the beginning was a text by Robbie Wall Kimmer and the grammar of inanimacy, uh, animacy, sorry. And, and Robin Wall Kimmer was one of, our, the, one of the texts that influenced our project. 
she reflects on English as a known based language where you are either a human or you are an it, a thing. The grammar boxes are seen a, in uh, it and reduces more than human in object, basically. Uh, so I was wondering if you could expand more on how uh, to use a scientific approach such as uh, collecting environmental data through quadrants method uh, without reducing more than humans in mere objects of study and, and in what way the, does language influence your practice and what are the limits and where do you see unexpected potential? I would love to know more about that. And if maybe you have, you have changed during the process, your ideas on it. Yeah, I think what, what we see in this text and how, how it's being, how language is being described, you know, language really creates a window through which people look at their world, look at their surroundings. And language also has the power of creating habits very much. The way we grow up with language will create the, the outlooks that we have on a daily basis and the outlooks that we have uh, habitual. So us, this very much led into this idea of the prompt as something that takes you out of your typical window, out of your typical way of viewing your environment and opening up your, your sort of perception to to ways of looking that might extend that window for a moment, even if it's just for five minutes or half an hour. Mm. But yeah, this idea was very important for us. Yeah, and, and another um, a reason why we ended up picking emojis um, instead of um, just giving a title was to sort of bring in another type of language. And we speak a lot through emojis and the younger generation is, is very um, attuned to what emojis mean and how they express feelings and what they say. Um, so we wanted to carry that idea of um, maybe staying away from the Latin words that science uses um, to making it something that younger citizen scientists will be able to engage in. Um, and so that was an, another reason for exploring language in a different way through image and emojis, just to open that up as well. Yeah. Yeah. I think also Marjorie has a question for you guys. I don't know if Marjorie, you wanna? Uh, yes, just kind of expand on Kiara's question. So it's also a question for both of you. How did you first initiate your idea and what are the references that you go through doing your own research? And um, how would you say what is your innovative part? And how would you say about like your, um, your kind of contribution and legacy of your project? It's a question oh, to uh, apply logic and Ausblau. Can I go first? Yeah, you go first. <laughs> could you, could you uh, briefly um, condense the question, just to remind me? It's about like the whole journey doing your research and how would you say it's like the very innovative part and where's the legacy of it? Yeah. So research-wise, um, I think the biggest is hard to just, you can't really, obviously you want to do something original, but with, you know, being my job, you can't just ignore things that have come in the past. And I still look for inspiration, still look um, for inspiration from all the studios and other practitioners that I look up to. And not so much as I like what is, trending or what is popular but instead like what is done like instead of just repeating stuff you want to kind of yeah that's how I often um think of innovation as it's like moving stuff forward and being original and so often my research and references act as like uh yeah a reference point for what has been done and what can be done next um and I don't know if I'd go to the extent of like legacy at this point in my practice but it's more putting it out there as a reference for someone else, hopefully. Um, 
and how also as kind of as, as a talking point. Um, it's all nice to kind of talk amongst um, myself and my friends about this conversation, but I think the one of the benefits of doing this commission with the RCA and the ODI is getting out there and getting the publicity and hopefully it reaches people um, and is, you know, interests them in the subject. Thank you. Add a bit on there. So I think actually what was really nice about this particular project is it involves so many different people from different perspectives. And I think when we approach projects, we always try to, you know, collect the information and viewpoints and, and we really think that collaboration is um, something that will drive forward an idea to be different um, and not specifically you know, from the from the start, go okay. Well, we have to make this an innovative step, but think about what we're trying, what our aim is, and allowing that process to guide the outcome. Um, and I think we all like, maybe didn't expect that we would end up with this particular outcome of the observatory. So many ideas. We tried to let the ideas of everybody in this group, as well as our own and our own vision. Um, to guide that outcome coming forward to be something that is very um, in tune with the brief and in, you know in tune with who we are as people and what we want to say. Um, yeah. Yeah, and I think what also comes in always at this point is innovation. I think comes from a specific context automatically. If you and I think it was very helpful from the start that we were focusing on the regions canal on on this very situation uh, later on in, in Kemley Street Natural Park and how you know every situation will lead you to a specific innovation without even aiming for the for innovation in itself you know but just by focusing on on the situation I think you're, you're creating something that uniquely will speak for your vision and for all the factors that you are trying to incorporate anyways. Yeah, I think one an, an example also of um, letting the, the process guide the outcome was also when we involved um, the workshop. And, you know, we spoke a lot about when the workshop would be throughout the process of this entire um, project when we, um, with the RCA team. Um, you know, should that be at the end and should the, should the workshop be using the tool or should that workshop come in at the start and inform the process to guide how the tool is made. Um, and it was really nice that we involved the workshop in at the start to allow that experience to come into um, creating a richer experience for the canal observatory and, um, and how that functions. And, and um, the students that were in that workshop actually had incredible viewpoints that, um, yeah, I think really drove the outcome forward. Thank you so much. And I will hand over to Jiaqi. Hi, guys. Um, I have some questions to ask us as well. So actually, um, in this project, we know the Canal Observatory is a, like, like, um, used as a gamification tool for the Canal collection and connecting the human, non-human words. Oh, sorry, human and more than human words. So I'm just wondering, like, how how do you think digital technology contributes in formulating a more responsible or like, like um, responsive shared space? Yeah, I think it can be used, yeah, both irresponsibly and responsibly. I think what we tried to do with um, applied logic is, you know, discuss how this platform could be something that everyone can access and something that anyone could log on to, even if they're not at the canal. So for example, with an app, sometimes apps don't work on your phone. And so, you know, they, they, it becomes a barrier for people to engage in that technology. And so we decided collectively to not make an app and to make it on a platform that's just a website. So it's something that with the QR code, you just, you just go on to, um, it, it leads you onto the web page. And that same page can be accessed even if you're not at the canal. 
So anyone can see what's being collected in that space. And it doesn't become, you know, behind a password. It's not, you know, a collective archive monitored by someone privately. It's an archive that's open and anyone can go on that website and, and see what's being collected. And we would love that one day the, the list of species can grow. You know, we could only do the amount that we could do within the project. Um, but yeah, that, that platform, it was really important that technology in this instance was used as something that's very open and accessible. Um, I don't know if you have more to say about that, um, Tom. Um, yeah, I think what was interesting about like using um, technology responsibly, um, and I don't think you see, there's not many projects which have these intentions of, um, I don't know, such like being like, particularly meaningful. Um, it's more like what's the coolest thing you can do with tech and I think you have to kind of put those um, urges aside and think about like what to do responsibly um, and yeah having this kind of tool um, will be really interesting to see how it might develop in the future and having something although you know you don't want to be too like data focused because of like the energy consume it consumes but I think that because of the simplicity of it and having not too a large impact, it will be interesting to see um, the kind of message that it portrays by collecting certain species. And that would definitely like, it would speak for itself, I think. Right, thank you. I think it's a really a constructive answer and also truly the combination of nature and technology is really does something we need to consider at this moment. So like, thank you both of you for clarifying. And I'm gonna hand over to Sage. He also gonna have some questions. Yeah, thanks. In the past few weeks, we've been doing the, the collaborative research called Walls of Water. We have interact, we have interviewed some other uh, experts in the different areas. So I'm very curious. Um, so the first question might be asking me of biologic that uh, how did the collaborative research contribute in the uh, gamified uh, uh, gamified idea gamified uh, how did that contribute how did uh, what role has been uh, played in the in the process and the second might be asking me as well that how the versus water become a uh, resource become a research for the quadrants idea. Is that makes sense? So if I understand, like how the research and collaboration influence the outcome of the project. Yeah. So I think um, collaboration with Alice Pearl is um, a great kind of, well, kind of honour, but it's like I think collaborating with anyone, uh, particularly when I don't know how, how often you get to collaborate with like another collective, another studio, because often you're kind of doing your own thing, but working with other people from other disciplines and both using your own expertise and skills uh, allows you to create something even better. And so just doing it on your own. Uh, and so seeing maybe myself coming from like a more digital um, and visual background and our flows expertise in research um, and just more physical work and now you have kind of as an outcome it has the physical element to it the quadrants and this tool and it just has a lot more depth to it it's not just an app it's like a whole experience and interaction um, and that was something which i haven't like something which i've personally been trying to do more which is more physical work um, but by doing this collaboration is yeah, enable me to do something which I haven't done before. Who the answer? Who the answer is it? Yeah, that was very good. Thank you. What was the question for us? I've forgotten. Sorry. Um, the so waterways help. Yeah. Yeah, we have collaborative research on uh, wells of water and how that uh, contributes to the outcome of the project. Yeah, I think um, 
the for us we had a yeah a few touch points that you know the research that was coming through the um there was a previous talk on on the odi fridays um there were the interviews and i think this whole collection and and all these conversations that we've had going um the in for the for the last couple of months of as we've been putting this together and then um you know coming together and doing the workshop all of these touch points they they pushed us you know they they pushed us to think differently about the space and and to have um yeah different viewpoints i think that that is translated into the final result um also a lot of you know conversations about how this digital platform should should be and how to make also look at the ecological footprint of that so i think um yeah it's been a really great journey for us we've enjoyed collaborating with everyone that's been in this process um particularly I, i'd like to kind of reflect back on the moment where we were sitting in the circle with all the students and we were reading these texts with each other and um about um that Kiara had brought to the table and I I just love that moment of sharing and bringing in someone else's work from an outside perspective from a from a book and um and bringing that into the circle to then push us all again to rethink what we're doing and how we're doing it and I felt like throughout the entire process we really helped each other to do that it was a really nice um yeah nice process that I think yeah pushed our thinking a lot um anything to say yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, should I hand over back to uh, Hannah? Uh, uh, yes, that's fine. Hi, thank, thank you. you all so much. What an absolutely fascinating project and an amazing talk. Brilliant questions. I mean, the two things, two of the many things that have really stuck in my mind, are this concept of dirty data when you're making something so attractive that it distorts your data. That's a really thought provoking. And also, Tom, your comment on moving away from what what can be the coolest thing I can do with the technology to what will be the most responsible really chimes for me as someone who started working with technology in the very early 1990s when the coolest thing was you know very much part of the conversation so that's brilliant we do have a question from the floor from Ben who said I'm really interested in the canal as an industrial infrastructure that now is not used so much for its original function and even operates as an alternative space for leisure living etc and I was wondering how different ideas of the use and usefulness might also be related to ideas of data. Can waterways and dataways be repurposed as spaces of citizen empowerment rather than tools of commodification and monitoring? And what might the role of art curating and design be in repurposing? So I think that speaks very much to your ambitions. I don't know who's going to be the spokesperson responding to that, but I think it might be good. We've got a few minutes to give the floor to the artist first. So go Ausblau and then Tom, if you could respond. First. First, first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, so hold on, let me just get the question. So it was um around um how data can be used. Maybe it's really it's connecting, which Ferg referred to oh, in yeah. the introduction, okay. um waterways yeah. and dataways being repurposed as spaces of citizen empowerment rather than commodification and monitoring. And and I feel like you're moving this is this is at the heart of what you're doing, really. Yeah, no, truly, uh, there's definitely this interest in our, in our work in the, the communal aspect of data sharing. We have explored this also in previous projects already of how uh, this sort of ways that we work with data today can really empower citizens on a grassroots level, you could almost say. And yeah, we definitely think the way that, for example, the boater community is using the canals, there's also the sort of sense of community and sharing resources and acting much more on a on a citizen level, interacting on a citizen level, and yeah, that we're now trying to uh, incorporate this communal aspect beyond the human, so the more than human um, communities, let's say, or eco ecosystematical communities. That's maybe what what is important to us. Yeah, I think um, also in our research we were we were reading a lot that the the boaters become a they they have a really active role in identifying a lot of um what's happening along the canal and reporting you know if they see an oil spill or if they see a bloom or a rubbish pile or if there's dead fish in this part of the canal so they become a really like active 
process in um, helping the Canal Trust collect that data and know how to action and what to do um, and, or where to go to fix certain issues. Um, so they become sort of like the eyes on the canal. Um, and I guess what we were trying to do is set up not only reflection points in the canal space um, that collects different data, but you know, engaging passers-by, the people that would just go there for that leisurely experience that for themselves on the canal, but how can they um, be a part of the data stream that the canal is um, collecting? Okay, thank you. Tom, would you like to offer a last word? We've got a few more minutes. Yeah, so I think yeah, there's a good point about like how um, repurposing data and waterways from something which is predominantly commodification and monitoring to something which is more empowering and like open source. And I think there's a lot of stuff you can do with data as exemplified. You know, it might just be a matter of using a database and counting species, but just by doing that, you're empowering the people that are using it. Um, in the matter of kind of informing them more about the canal um, in a constructive manner. And whilst I think art, curating and design and the kind of matter of repurposing, I think repurposing kind of goes to the extent of something more like engineering architecturally and product design, but the significance of this project and its kind of artistic value is um, opening that conversation up, up to begin with, that kind of reinterpretation of the waterways and dataways. And I guess the next step would be how you take that kind of interpretation and not in a, um, in a more contemporary manner, like how do you commodify that? How do you, do, how do you commodify it? and monitor it for a um, better cause instead of causes which people might be against at the time. At the time. I hope that makes sense. Thank you. That's a wonderful question to end on. And I'm afraid we do have to end. Um, for anyone who wants to continue this conversation, the project launches tomorrow in the flesh at the Camley Street um, Natural Park N14PW. The details are in the chat. It will be going on between 2 p.m. and 4 p.m. tomorrow. And there'll be a performance by the artist Becky Horn at 3 p.m. You will also have the opportunity to engage with the Canal Observatory digital tool and the website with the quadrant at the canal for several months afterwards but it would be wonderful to see people there tomorrow and we're all looking forward to it so i just want to thank the team from the royal college of art tom from applied logic and al splau and everybody who's joined us today and anyone who's watching later and we'll just say thank you very much goodbye cheers <laughs>